I'd like to welcome the parents and the teachers and the students and also watching us via long distance education our schools from around the US and we also have a uh, school in Ghana and West Africa who's also joining the program so welcome to all of uh, all the schools who are joining us from uh, around the US and around the world uh, I'd like to thank the uh, presidential center conference center staff uh, they help facilitate these programs. We couldn't do it without them. So to the Presidential Conference Center staff, thank you very much. Um, to all the volunteers. So President Bush and his inaugural address talked about a thousand points of light. And what he was talking about was volunteers across the US. And we have a lot of those thousand points of light that uh, volunteer their time with um, us. And we couldn't do programs like this because we simply don't have the staff big enough to do it. Uh, without those thousand points of light. So thanks to our volunteers. And then also our education department, which is the best in all of Texas. And uh, Dr. Shirley Hammond and her staff who put on great programs like this today. So if you give a hand to Dr. Shirley Hammond and her staff. So I know you're gonna enjoy the program. Uh, uh, this is one of the one of the more most enjoyable. All of them are enjoyable. This is one of the most enjoyable programs uh, that we do. So I'm going to invite Dr. Shirley Hammond to the podium, and she's going to introduce today's program. But again, thank you all for being here. Um, let's give a round of applause to our director of the library, Warren Finch. We are so glad that you are here today, and it is my um, very great honor and also privilege to introduce John Erickson today. He's the legendary Texas author. He's legendary because he's the one who created Hank the Cow Dog, and Hank is the famous dog with many Texas ranch adventures. In fact, Mr. Um, Erickson has actually written 83 books that include Hank the Cow Dog books and Ranch Life books. So it has actually become one of our nation's leading best-selling and most popular book series. And of course, we knew that in Texas, but it's national and international. It's been translated into four different languages. So join me in welcoming John Erickson. Chickens. All I see are chickens. It really is the dickens when the mind plays clever tricks, projecting colored pictures of a bird upon a plate. Such a cruel fate. Dinners. All I see are dinners. <coughs> Just exactly what a sinner doesn't need. It's so frustrating to see roasted birds parading down the Broadway of my mind. Destiny's unkind. On the other hand, it's really kind of neat to have these visions. It provides a little break between decisions. Don't forget a dog needs rest, a break from all the stress of working day and night to earn his pay. Sleeping. Sally Mae is sleeping 
And while she sleeps, I'm creeping like a panther through a park at ease in total darkness, like a phantom in the night, but still aware it isn't right. Lurking images are lurking. I hear the sounds of slurping in the river of my mouth. My life is going south, for if I should get caught, I'd have to eat these chicken thoughts. On the other hand, there's a kind of that I am needing. It's the calm that soothes the conscience after eating. Good digestion forms a link to what we do and think. Cause nourishment is part of mental health. Chicken. My heart grows wild for you. You're the soft caress of morning dew. My heart just grows wild for you. The fragrant earth sustains it. The sky just won't contain it. My heart grows wild for you. My heart glows wild for you. You're the sun that gives it light and hue. My heart just glows wild for you. Love's flame knows no season It burns both rhyme and reason My heart glows wild for you My heart, my heart goes wild for you. Madness rushing when what can I do? My heart just goes wild for you. I don't have words to name it. I lack the will to tame it. My heart goes wild for you. for you well those of you those of you who were properly raised on Hank Cadog audiobooks know that there's a musical side to the to the Hank stories I do them all as audiobooks, <clears throat> and an, with an audiobook, you can do something that you can't do in a regular paper, paper book, which is bring in music. And <clears throat> I was raised in a little town up in the Panhandle. It's, uh, it's probably about 500 miles north, north and west of here, and uh, almost 
to Kansas. It's a little old windswept farm and ranch town, but I grew up in a musical family. My my dad played the piano, played classical music on the piano. He was church organist in our church. I started singing in choirs when I was about four years old and sang in high school choirs and uh, the University of, well, I won't mention the name where I went to school. It's a, uh, it's a small school um, around Austin. <coughs> they have a football team. Yeah, that one. <coughs> uh, we can't mention it in College Station, but that's where I went and I sang in the a cappella choir. Chris and I sing in the church choir now. I play the banjo, started playing the banjo when I was in junior, in, no, a junior in high school. And uh, I've played it all my life. And I come up with ideas for songs, so <coughs> I'm not really qualified to do what I'm doing today, standing in front of a respectable audience of people and uh, singing songs that I wrote and am playing. But I'm doing it anyway because it's fun and uh, the audience seems to enjoy it. And I have these songs that are on the Hank audio books. Now the first one, I don't remember which book that's from, but it, it's very revealing of Hank's character. It gives us, kind of opens the door on his subconscious mind and we know what he's thinking about every time a chicken walks past. <laughs> and he knows what Sally May will do if he does what he's thinking about doing. He'll get in big trouble with the boss's wife. So he lives <clears throat> He lives in this subterranean world where when a chicken walks past, it looks like a baked chicken on a plate. <coughs> the second one was a pretty song. It's called My Heart Goes Wild For You. It comes from the uh, seventh Hank story, um, the Curse of the Incredible Price is Corn Cob. And in that story, Hank leaves the ranch, runs away. He's going to join up with the coyotes and become a cannibal and seek out Miss Beulah the Collie. No, not Miss Beulah. Uh, Missy Coyote. She's a coyote princess. And they meet out in the pasture and they sing that song. Hank is thinking about going back to the wild, becoming a coyote. And that's what that song is about. And Missy Coyote kind of likes him, even though he's kind of a fool. So in the eighth Hank story, Hank runs into a kind of animal that he's never met before. Now, he's head of ranch security on a ranch up in the Panhandle, so he knows about coyotes and raccoons skunks, badgers, buzzards, silver monster birds, little boys, and he's never met a little girl. There's not one on the ranch. And uh, so he's play he he's used to boys and and all the noise they make and he likes boys he thinks he doesn't like girls or he won't like girls but in this story uh, a little girl named Ashley it's uh, it's little Alfred's cousin comes with her grandmother to visit for Thanksgiving and there are two girls and they're out in the backyard playing beauty shop and tea party. And Hank watches Drover. You know Drover. Little short-haired, sawed-off, chicken-hearted little mutt. Drover, they invite Drover to come in and get his hair fixed. 
and he just loves it. And Hank watches it. They even dress him up in doll clothes. And Hank watches this and said, Drover, you look ridiculous. He says, yeah, I know wearing a dress makes me look kind of silly, but you know, this is really wonderful. I, I really like these girls, and I think you would too. You ought to get your hair fixed. He says, I will never get my hair fixed. I will never go to a beauty shop. I don't like girls. Well, this little eight-year-old girl, Ashley, sees him. He's outside the yard gate. And he, she says, hi. Well, he turns away. He's not even going to look at her. <clears throat> well, she comes out and opens the gate and starts stroking him on the head and she scratches his ears and he looks into her eyes and suddenly he floats through the air and lands in her beauty shop chair and she has a little box plastic box with her tools and she opens it up and she gets a soft bristle brush and starts brushing his hair and brushes his ears and brushes him under the chin where dogs love to be rubbed. And he doesn't even notice that his hair is up in pink rollers. And by then he's lost. He's fallen head over heels in love with this eight-year-old girl with the, which is something that daddies do, by the way. I got the idea for this when my eight-year-old daughter, Ashley, came up and started playing beauty shop with my hair, which is something my two boys had never thought about doing. But she was, she was really something special, and I got the idea for this song. And this is the one that Hank sings to this Ashley in, in the story. Oh, little boys, like snakes and frogs, they're mean to cats and puppy dogs. They'll pull your tail and twist your nose and drive their tractors across your toes. They'll make you mad and they'll make you howl and make you wish for a little gal. Thank you, Lord, for making gals. They give a boost to our morale. This would be a sad old world if we had frogs instead of girls. These little donkeys we call boys, they make a mess and lots of noise. You always know when they're close by. They tease the girls and make them cry. They're hard on clothes and break their toys. There ain't much use for little boys. Thank you, Lord, for making gals. They give a boost to our morale. This would be a sad old world if we had frogs instead of girls. Little boys aren't fit to keep. They'll mess things up and make you weep. They'll keep the place all torn apart. They'll run your hose and break your heart. They'll make you cuss and they'll make you growl and make you wish for a little gal. Thank Thank you, Lord, for making gals. They give a boost to our morale. This would be a sad old world if we had frogs instead of girls. So, thanks again for making gals. They'll treat you nice and be your pals. But I swear by the stars above, watch out or you'll fall in love.
Well, that's a, that's a song that I thought of when my little Ashley was playing beauty shop with my hair. So, uh, but I had a good time with my boys and I got song ideas from my boys too. Uh, you know, I have these characters in the stories, coyotes. <coughs> Every ranch has coyotes, and uh, they're wild, wild dogs is what they are. And uh, dogs are fascinated by them because they look like dogs. They can bark like dogs. Sometimes they even play with the dogs, but they're not dogs. There's something different about coyotes. And uh, dogs are a little bit afraid of them. Hank is kind of fascinated by them, too, because they don't have jobs. They don't have to work like he does. He's head of ranch security, you know. He has to get up early in the morning and stay up late at night and patrol the ranch, bark at every airplane that flies over, bark at the birds that roost in his trees without his permission. Uh, he has to humble the cat several times a day. And then of course he has to watch and guard Sally Mae's chickens. <laughs> Coyotes don't have any job or duties. They stay up all night, they howl at the moon, they sing songs, they have belching contests, they beat up skunks and badgers, and uh, you know, Hank kind of admires that, they, and they sing. They have terrible voices, but they like to sing. And uh, over the course of the Hank audiobooks, I've written a number of songs for the Coyotes, and uh, none of them are very good songs, but they're fun to sing. And uh, I thought I might teach y'all one of the songs. Would you like to sing a trashy Coyote song? All right, well, in Faded Love, number five, Hank runs in to these coyote brothers. And he's on his way to visit Miss Beulah the Collie, his one and only true love, when he's not thinking about Missy Coyote or Miss Scamper the Beagle or one of the other girls that crosses his path. He's he's gonna go see Miss Beulah the Collie and he has a problem with her. She doesn't seem to take him seriously. She's interested in a bird dog named Plato, which Hank considers an insult because bird dogs are dingbats. Anyone who owns one knows that. <coughs> How could she choose a bird dog over a handsome heroic cow dog? He doesn't understand it. He keeps looking for some kind of magic trick or potion to capture her heart. Well, Rip and Snort have just found a dead skunk, and they teach Hank something that he never knew before, which is that amongst the cannibals, when a guy wants to impress his girlfriend, he doesn't send chocolates or flowers. He rolls on a dead skunk because the women are crazy about that deep manly aroma. This is something that boys learn around the eighth or ninth grade. And so uh, Rip and Snort teach him this in a song. It's called Rotten Meat. I'm gonna teach you the chorus, so pay attention. Rotten meat. Rotten meat, the odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. 
Coyotes love to cheat and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without rotten meat. Kind of pretty, isn't it? All right, let's go over the words. Rotten meat, rotten meat. The odors deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat. And we love to eat. This life would be rotten without rotten meat. All right, that's a little weak, but uh, let's practice it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Rotten meat, rotten meat. The odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to, and we love to. This life would be rotten without rotten meat. Well, it's still a little weak. I think kids in Austin could probably outsing you. But we'll try it. We'll try it. This ought to be a great Aggie song. So, <clears throat> I'm going to do Snort's part, which is the hard part. And then I'll tell you when to come in. You join me on the chorus. He's got a terrible voice, by the way. There's many a mystery's got lost in our history, but none more important for us to repeat than this secret potion, this coyote love lotion, the wonderful essence of ripe stinking meat. Hit it! Rotten meat, rotten meat, the odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to and we love to this life would be rotten without yeah i know a feller his coat is dark yeller he's got sinus drainage and sneezes a lot he had no success in the women department until he discovered the perfume of rot hit it rotten meat rotten meat the odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat and we love to. This life would be rotten without. Wow. The secret of courtship in coyote circles depends on the deep manly smell of the guy. A woman worth courting wants guys who are sporting who stink to high heaven and smell to the sky. We wear rotten meat, we share rotten meat, the aftershave lotion that's sure hard to beat. Coyotes always smell neat, we've accomplished the feat of charming our women with rotten what? Meat. Yeah. All right. Well, those of you who have read Hank books, which better be all of you. All right. You know who Drover is. He's a little short-haired, sawed-off, chicken-hearted, stub-tailed little mutt. And uh, he's afraid of storms and lightning and loud noises. And, uh, but you know, he's a sweet little guy and he's very popular as a character. Sometimes kids like Drover better than they do Hank. And uh, so years ago, I uh, kids started telling me you need to get, give Drover a st book of his own. And I had never thought of that, and I decided I would try it. So I started the book, and I found out 
that it was not going to be easy because Drover never does anything. So I had to go way back into his childhood when he was a pup living in a yard in the town of Twitchell. And uh, so he's the last pup. He, he, was, he was in a litter of nine pups. And all of his brothers and sisters have moved on. They've gotten jobs or homes, and they have left their mother in and, uh, and the yard. And Drover is still alone with his mother. And in people years, he would be about 25 years old. And uh, if you've ever had a mother dog, you know that when their pups get almost as big as they are, they turn really crabby. And when the pup comes up wanting to try some of mom's milk, she turns and bares her teeth at him and says, will you leave me alone? Go get a job. Yeah, those sweet little mother dogs, they, uh, they have fangs and they show them to those pups that don't want to leave mother's dairy bar. So that's where Drover is with his mother. And one day she comes to him and says, uh, Drover, I think it's time you moved on. At a certain point, every dog has to leave home and go find his place in the world and find a job. He says, a job? You mean work? Yes, that's what it means. Yeah, but I kind of like it around here. Yes, I noticed that, she says. But it's time for you to move along. And uh, so he gets up and starts walking towards the hole under the fence. And all at once, his leg goes out on him. He hits the ground and says, oh, my leg. It just quit me, Ma. Maybe I better stay one more night. A month later, he's still there. She comes to him and says, Drover, uh, how's the leg? Well, you know, it was coming along real well, but then I took a spell this morning and it got worse. How long do you think this is going to take? Well, these legs are kind of slow to heal sometimes. It sometimes it takes days or weeks or years. Huh. And suddenly she says, Drover, quick, run. The yard's on fire. Well, he jumps up and heads for the hole under the fence. Burrows underneath the fence, comes up out in the alley and says, Okay, Ma, I made it. Come on through. He hears a clunking sound and looks into the tunnel and sees that somebody has moved a piece of plywood over the, over the hole on the other side. Hey, Ma, somebody plugged the hole. I guess you'll have to climb the fence. She says, Drover, can you come back for Christmas dinner? Christmas dinner, that's six months from now. Right. We'll see you at Christmas. Watch out for the dog catcher and go find a job. Well, he sits down in the alley and sings this song. It's kind of sad, but maybe we can get through it. I'm not on a mission I'd rather go fishing Than look for a job But mother's a cheapskate 
and now she is irate. She thinks I'll be J.O. bait if I'm unemployed. I think I will throw up. I don't want to grow up. I don't want to show up for job interviews. My life would be easier with nothing but leisure. I never will please her, so what is the point? She thinks I'm a bum. I know that I'm dumb. I'm sucking my thumb and trying to hide. I'd rather stay home and sit like a stone or chew on a bone or sleep in the shade. Nobody would hire me, I'm sure it would tire me, the effort would tire me and stir up my leg. There's no sense in wishing for nuclear fission, I have no ambition. So leave me alone. Well, would you mind if I read some Hank to you? <clears throat> I think that would be fun. Speaking of Drover, he's in this passage. <clears throat> he's a funny little guy. <clears throat> All right, this is from <clears throat> book number 61, The Case of the Prowling Bear. And uh, it's a winter time. <clears throat> Hank and Drover are spending the night at Slim Chance's bachelor shack on the banks of Wolf Creek. Slim Chance is the, the hired hand on this ranch. He's a cowboy. And uh, <coughs> he lives in what's called the tenant house. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> it's an old house with a tar paper on the outside and it's got a wood-burning stove. And uh, Hank and Drover like to hang out with Slim in the wintertime because he lets them come in the house on cold winter nights. Sally Mae does not let dogs into her house, so they have to stay outside when they're up at headquarters. So we have Hank and Drover <coughs> in, the, uh, <coughs> in the house. It's the middle of the night. Uh, Slim has built up the fire in the wood in the wood stove, and he's gone to his bedroom, gone to bed. Hank and Drover are curled up around the wood burning stove, asleep. And Hank hears a voice. It's Drover's voice, and he says, "Hank, I'm thirsty." I looked into his eyes and felt that I was looking into two, two cardboard tubes with nothing on the other end. That might sound cruel, but it was true. <coughs> you woke me up to tell me that you're thirsty? That's ridiculous. How can you be thirsty in the middle of the night? I don't know, but I am. 
why didn't you get a drink before you went to bed? I was afraid I might wet on the floor. Oh, brother. Drover, you are the most... Slim keeps a water bowl beside the back door. <clears throat> Instead of waking me up, why didn't you just go to the water bowl and get yourself a drink? Well, I tried, but it was empty. I guess he forgot to fill it. Then why didn't you do the obvious? Walk into the bathroom and drink out of the pot. That's what pots are for. He rolled his eyes around. Well, it's dark in there, and I'm scared of the dark. Oh, brother. <coughs> <coughs> so you expect me to give you an escort to the bathroom? Is that what you're saying? He nodded. Forget that, pal. I'm off duty, and I don't give escorts in the middle of the... <sighs> but if, if you don't get your drink... You'll be whining all night, and I'll never get back to sleep. I'm sorry to be such a burden. If you're so sorry, quit being a burden. Drink water during the daylight hours, like every other dog in America. Come on, let's get this over with. I sure appreciate this. Please hush. I headed down the dark hallway and stopped at the bathroom door. Drover followed. Okay, this is the bathroom. The pot is over there. Get your drink and hurry up. He crept into the bathroom. A moment later, I heard him say, Uh-oh. What does that mean? Somebody put the lid down on the pot. Impossible. Bachelors never do that. Well, somebody did. Come look. There was just enough moonlight coming through the window so that I could see the device. And much to my surprise, Drover had gotten it right. Somebody had put down the lid. Drover was fretting. What'll we do now? We? You're the one who wants a drink. Figure it out. Yeah, but Drover, put your nose under the lid, lift it up, and stick your head inside. What if my head gets caught? It won't get caught. The lid is on hinges. Well, I guess I could try. Give it a try. I licked my lips and realized that they were dry. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of thirsty myself, so make it snappy. Drover slipped his nose under the lid, poked his head inside the bowl, and began lapping. The sound of water produced mental pictures of a pool of crystal clear spring water on a hot afternoon. I was ready for a drink. Are you done yet? He removed his head and I noticed that he was making a sour face. What's wrong? I don't know. The water has a funny taste. I don't want any more. Good. It's my turn. I thought you weren't thirsty. I wasn't until I had to stand here listening to you guzzle. You know, Hank, I'm not sure you ought to drink that water. It has a soapy taste. Get out of the way. I pushed him aside, slipped my nose under the lid, lifted up several inches, and plunged my entire head, face, and nose into the porcelain bowl. Then, with the wooden seat resting against the top of my head, I began lapping cool spring water. Okay, maybe it had an odd taste. But ranch dogs don't worry about such little details. Hey, we're the same guys who drink out of stock tanks, creeks, and mud puddles. Wow, great water. And it really hit the spot. I drank my fill, and at that point, all I had to do was... Huh? Holy smokes, I couldn't get my head out. See, the toilet seat was resting on top of my head. 
and when I tried to back out, the stupid lid became wedged behind my ears. Actually, there was never any chance of me drowning. But let me tell you something. If your head has never been trapped inside a toilet bowl, don't laugh at someone who's been through such an ordeal. It was scary. My mind was telling me it wasn't a big deal, but there I was in this dark place, hearing my own voice in an echo chamber. It sounded like, I don't know, like a voice from the bottomless pit of doom. Drover, do something. We have a code three. I can't get my head out of here. I tried to tell you. Hurry up and do something. Help murder. What's a dog to do? I went to full reverse on all engines. And we're talking about all four legs digging deep and throwing up sparks in the night. After a terrible struggle, my head popped free and... Well, I went roaring backwards, hit the wall, and ended up on the floor. Two towels fell off the towel rack, rack and landed on top of my head. Wow, I had survived the experience, but then, oops, the bathroom light came on, and I found myself looking into the eyes of slim chance. There he stood in his red one-piece long john underwear. <laughs> hair down in his face and wearing an expression that suggested irritation. Mad. He looked mad and burned me up with a hostile glare. Hank, were you drinking out of the pot? Why had he addressed that question to me? What about the little ninny who had started this whole thing? It was then that I realized that Drover had vanished, leaving me all alone to face Slim's wrath. I held my head at a proud angle and gave him a direct gaze that said, Of course we were drinking out of the pot. What did you expect? You fed us dry popcorn for supper and didn't put out any water for us, and we chose not to perish from thirst. I got my head caught in the commode, but I managed to survive. Thanks for all your concern, and you can go back to bed. Slim rolled his eyes and shook his head. Bird brain. I closed the lid on the pot for a reason. A reason? I put Babbo in the water. Babbo? Cleanser. You drank toilet bowl cleanser. Huh? Huh. Perhaps that explained the odd taste. Well, how was I supposed to know? Slim wasn't famous for cleaning anything in his house. And who would have guessed? Uh-oh. Something was happening in the depths of my stomach. It came suddenly in a rush, in a blur. My head began moving up and down. and I heard odd noises coming from deep inside my body. Ump, ump, ump. Slim's soggy eyes burst into flames. Get out of here, outside, quick. He made a dash for the front door and I heard him yell, this way, pooch, outside. You know, in moments of crisis, we sometimes make peculiar decisions. Later, we look back on our actions and wonder why we did them. See, I knew he wanted me to make a dash for the front door and to finish off the drama in his yard. 
it would have been the sensible thing to do, and yet, in that tense, stressful moment when I had to choose between going left toward the front door or going right towards the darkness and solitude of Slim's bedroom, I uh, made a hard right turn and went galloping down the hall to the bedroom. Looking back, I can only guess that I couldn't bear the thought of purging my system in front of an audience. Yes, it was my sense of modesty that drove me into the bedroom. I was ashamed that I had guzzled tainted water, ashamed that I had ignored the little warning signs of my taste buds, ashamed that the nasty stuff had made me ill. And most of all, I was furious that Drover had sat there like a stump and allowed me to drink poison. Okay, maybe he'd muttered something about funny taste, but he should have warned me that the stuff was contaminated, contaminated, cremated. He should have warned me that someone had tampered with our water supply. But he didn't, and there I stood in Slim's bedroom. My mind was fogged, and my gizzardly depths cried out for some kind of release. I had to do something. So I did what any brave American dog would have done, what brave American dogs have been doing for centuries. I crawled under the bed. There, I found the privacy that I needed for this ordeal, a place where I could correct my mistakes in a quiet spot and spare myself the humilification of being mocked by a crowd of small minds. If I was lucky, nobody would ever find the mess. And you know, it worked out pretty well. The first 10 seconds were violent and messy, but then it was over. I had faced the crisis head on, and now it was just an unpleasant memory. Good news, but things got even better when I was able to express this learning situation in a wonderful song called, Be Careful When You Drink From The Pot. You might think the water's pure when it's not. A thirsty dog is full of hope, but if the bowl is full of soap, it changes the equation quite a lot. Well, that passage probably raised your IQ 15 points or more. <clears throat> so you need to read the rest of that book, The Case of the Prowling Bear. All right, well, I wanted to leave some time for you all to ask questions about the Hank series or my life as a rancher and a writer. And uh, we have ladies on in the aisles with the uh, microphones so that everybody can hear the questions um, how long have you been writing books how long have i written books yeah <coughs> well <coughs> i started writing i wrote a little bit my senior year in high school i never wrote anything growing up we didn't think writers could come from a little place like the one I grew up in, Perryton up in the Panhandle. So I didn't write until uh, I was a senior and I, our English teacher made us write poems and I found that it was easy for me. And uh, I wrote a little bit in college at that other school up there. And, uh, but I didn't really get serious about writing until I married a woman with high standards, and that really wrecked my bachelor life because 
She and her mother expected me to amount to something. I couldn't just sleep in dumpsters and howl at night and write a poem once a month. They expected me to do something with my life. And so I started getting serious about writing and I started writing every day. Okay, that's enough. What's your favorite book? What's my favorite book? Well, it would have to be a Hank the Cowdog book, of course. 